Hello, welcome to the Off Lies. Early human ancestors came out of the trees about 4.2 to 3.5 million years ago as our species adapted to a changing environment. So once we were comfortable swinging about in the air, have a look at this clip from Gunjan Saxena, the cargo girl, in which pilot applicants in the Indian Air Force are standing on a ledge and asked to jump. Sir, please, sir, very much. Sir, I feel like I'm scared. I said jump. Why won't jump? Sir, give me something else. Stop. Who did it? Jump. No, most of us fear jumping from heights. However, what if there was a device that would allow us to fall safely? Of course there is. The earliest evidence for the parachute dates back to Renaissance Italy in the 1470s. A drawing shows a free hanging man clutching a crossbar frame attached to a conical canopy. This device is slowing the motion of an object through the atmosphere by creating drag. The modern parachute was invented by Louis Sebastien Le Normand in France, who made the first recorded public jump in 1783. He coined the word parachute from parer to shield and chute to fall. In 1804, Jerome Lalande introduced a vent in the canopy to eliminate violent oscillations. In 1907, Charles Broadwick demonstrated two key advances in the parachute he used to jump from hot air balloons at fairs. He folded his parachute into a pack he wore on his back and the parachute was pulled from the pack by a static line attached to the balloon. In 1911, Grant Morton made the first parachute jump from an airplane, a Wright Model B, piloted by Phil Parmalee at Venice Beach in California. Morton's device was of the throwout type where he held the parachute in his arms as he left the aircraft. Also that year, Solomon Lee Van Meter Jr. of Kentucky received a patent for a backpack style parachute. He called it the Aviatory Life Boy. His self-contained device featured a revolutionary quick release mechanism, the ripcord, that allowed a falling aviator to expand the canopy only when safely away from the disabled aircraft. In 1913, Georgia Broadwick became the first woman to parachute jump from a moving aircraft, doing so over Los Angeles. In 1914, whilst doing demonstrations for the US Army, Broadwick deployed her chute manually, thus becoming the first person to jump free fall. The first military use of the parachute was by artillery observers on tethered observation balloons in World War I. These were tempting targets for enemy fighter aircraft, although difficult to destroy due to their heavy anti-aircraft defences. Because it was difficult to escape from them and dangerous when on fire due to hydrogen, observers would abandon them and descend by parachute as soon as enemy aircraft were seen. The main part of the parachute was in a bag suspended from the balloon with the balloonist wearing only a simple waist harness attached to the main parachute. Whilst this type of unit worked well from balloons, it had mixed results when used on fixed wing aircraft by the Germans, where the bag was stored in a compartment directly behind the pilot and the shroud lines became entangled with the spinning aircraft. A number of famous German fighter pilots were saved by this type of parachute, including Hermann Goering. No parachutes were issued to the crews of Allied aircraft since it was thought that if a pilot had a parachute he would jump from the plane when hit rather than trying to save the aircraft. How ludicrous. Airplane cockpits at that time also were not large enough to accommodate a pilot and a parachute. This is why the German type was stowed in the fuselage rather than being of the backpack type. Out of the first 70 German airmen to bail out, around a third died, including aces such as Oberlieutenant Erich Lohenhardt, who fell from 3,600 metres, and Fritz Rummy, who fell from 900 metres. These fatalities were mostly due to the chute or ripcord becoming entangled in the airframe of their spinning aircraft 
or because of harness failure, a problem fixed in later versions. In 1919, Leslie Irving successfully tested a Type A parachute that was worn as a soft pack on the back, used a ripcord and a pilot chute to draw out the main chute. He became the first person to make a premeditated free fall parachute jump from an aeroplane. Beginning with Italy in 1927, several countries experimented with using parachutes to drop soldiers behind enemy lines. By World War II, large airborne forces were trained and were used in surprise attacks, such as in the battles for Fort Eben Emanuel and The Hague, the first large-scale opposed landings of paratroopers in military history. This was followed later in the war by airborne assaults on a larger scale, such as the Battle of Crete and Operation Market Garden, the latter being the largest airborne military operation ever. In 1937, drag chutes were used in aviation for the first time by Soviets on aeroplanes in the Arctic that were providing support for the polar expeditions of the era, such as the first manned drifting ice station named North Pole 1. The drag chute allowed airplanes to land safely on smaller ice flows. Today's modern parachutes are classified into two, ascending and descending canopies. All ascending canopies refer to paragliders built specifically to ascend and stay aloft as long as possible. There he goes, as easy as that. There's someone coming into land. Round parachutes are purely a drag device. That is, unlike the ram air types, they provide no lift and are used in military, emergency and cargo applications. Forward speed of 5 to 13 kilometers per hour and steering can be achieved by cuts in various sections across the back or by cutting four lines in the back, therefore modifying the canopy shape to allow air to escape from the back of the canopy, providing limited forward speed. Wing loading of parachutes is measured similarly to that of aircraft, comparing the exit weight to area of parachute fabric. Typical wing loading for students, accuracy competitors and base jumpers is less than five kilos per square meter, often 0.3 kilos per square meter or less. Most sport jumpers fly with wing loadings between five and seven kilos per square meter, but many interested in performance landings exceed this wing loading. Professional canopy pilots compete with wing loading of 10 to 15 kilograms per square meter, while ram air parachutes with wing loading higher than 20 kilograms per square meter have been landed, this is strictly the realm of professional test jumpers. Smaller parachutes tend to fly faster for the same load and ellipticals respond faster to control input. Therefore, small elliptical designs are often chosen by experienced canopy pilots for the thrilling flying they provide. Paragliders, virtually all of which use ram air canopies, are more akin to today's sports parachutes than say parachutes of the mid 1970s and earlier. In many developed countries, emergency and reserve parachutes are packed by riggers who must be trained and certified according to legal standards. Reserve parachutes are packed and deployed somewhat differently. They are also designed more conservatively, favoring reliability over responsiveness and are built and tested to more exacting standards, making them more reliable than main parachutes. In 1960, Joseph Kittinger set a world record for the highest parachute jump, jumping from a balloon at an altitude of 102,800 feet or 31,333 meters, which was also a manned balloon altitude record at the time. He free fell for four minutes and 36 seconds, setting a still standing world record for the longest parachute free fall. The whole descent took 13 minutes and 45 seconds. During the descent, Kinji experienced temperatures as low as minus 70 C. 
In the free fall stage, he reached a top speed of 988 kilometers an hour, or Mark 0.8. Felix Baumgartner broke Joseph Kittinger's record on October the 14th, 2012, with a jump from an altitude of 38,969 meters, and reached speeds of up to 1,342 kilometers an hour, or nearly Mark 1.1. Unbelievable. Alan Eustace made a jump from the stratosphere on October the 24th, 2014, from an altitude of 41,419 metres. What does it feel like to eject from an aircraft going 1,290 kilometres per hour? Terrible. Test pilot George Smith survived this in 1955, bailing out of his F-100A, diving uncontrollably at 1.05 mark. The 40G deceleration removed his helmet, wristwatch, ring and most of his clothing. Subjects for another talk would be ejection seats, drogue chutes and sports parachutes. Consider these following questions. Were the use of parachutes from passenger aircraft ever considered? Probably, but only for a minute. Non-trained passengers leaping from an aircraft 30 kilometers high into frigid oxygen-free air, perhaps over an ocean, is fantasy. What about parachuting from a burning building whose exits are blocked? Perhaps. I for one would take my chances if there were no other choice. Come to think of it, zip lines to another building would be a good option too. Post your comments below and thank you for watching and subscribe. Thank you very much.